continue on with the study that uh, we started uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, regarding forgiveness. Now we tried to draw a little bit of a diagram as far as forgiveness is concerned and uh, uh, it's such a wide, wide, wide uh, uh, subject that it's uh, difficult to do justice to it in just one or two uh, sessions but uh, since we have covered it on another occasion or two, why well, maybe we can at least give some help concerning forgiveness. As you know, we're trying to do a little bit of diagramming of these truths. And uh, you'll recall last time when we uh, dealt with uh, the matter of forgiveness, we looked first of all at Romans chapter 5, verse 12, where it tells us the desperate need for forgiveness in light of sin. How that by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all of sin. So we tried to diagram it like this, that sin entered into the world, and as a result of sin, of course, there is death, which involves both spiritual death and physical death. Now, physical death is that each one of us, since we have a temporal body, we're going to die. But spiritual death is that separation of man from God, that there is not a relationship that man can have with God because sin has broken that relationship with him, and as a result, this is a called a spiritual death. Now then, we discovered that Sin is somewhat of a twofold nature. That is, there is such a thing as the presence of sin and the such a thing as the power of sin. Now then, we all will admit and we all recognize that sin is in the world. That's what it says. For by one man, sin entered into the world. Isn't that right? Sin exists, in other words. Then, not only does it exist, but it also leverages a tremendous force or power upon all people. Now, um, uh, I remember when I was just a kid, uh, I was the baby of the family, and the one next to me was my sister. Well, she was um, the one the closest to me, so she and I were the ones that did most of the fighting. As uh, fighting, I was always afraid of my older brothers because they were so big, they just beat the daylights out of me. But uh, I could outrun my sister sometimes, and uh, so uh, I'd fight with her. And I can remember so many, many times. Dorothy and I start out today. Says, "Well, now, uh, Albert and uh, I said, Dorothy, uh, let's not fight today, huh? Man alive! Wouldn't be ten minutes before we'd be at it again. So uh, uh, we might have had good intentions, isn't that right? Uh, no, we're just not going to do it. Well, <laughs> it didn't take long <laughs> because uh, sin uh, exercises." quite a force, exercises, quite a power, whereby activity comes to the form. And you and I are sure as a world going to manifest that activity. And so, sin it not only exists in the sense that it's present, but it also exercises a power whereby conduct and activity uh, manifests itself in some manner. Well, God so loved the world that he sent his son. And we find this in Romans, also in Romans 5, how that by one man the offense passed upon everyone, and so God sent another person, the person of his son, to die, and it tells me he died for sin once, once for all. He died on the cross. Now then, that's been a problem. I don't know whether it's been a problem in your mind or not, but it's always been a problem in my mind until I started dealing with that one subject of forgiveness. 
how did Christ die for sin and what did he do with reference to sin? I'm told in John chapter 1 how that uh, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, since Christ died, is there sin still in the world? Why, there sure is, isn't there? This whole world is just filled with turmoil and filled with difficulty. And you and I have a great deal of difficulty with this one thing called sin. Isn't that right? And so does the Bible contradict itself when it comes to this matter of sin? And the Bible says, Behold, the Lamb of God taketh away the sin of the world. Has sin been removed as far as the presence of sin? No, it hasn't. But I'm told it will someday. But that's the last enemy. That's the last thing which is to be taken care of when this old world and the plan of God is cared for. But he did die for sin in light of this, its power, because that power of sin, as we noticed last time, has also a twofold prong of significance, and that's this penalty and dominion. Now, death is a result of sin. That's the penalty. For by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. And it is appointed unto men once to die. Is that right? There's a little sign over there on the wall. Just take a look at it for a little bit. Born once, if you're born once physically, you're going to die twice. Now, if you're born twice, you're just going to die once. Think about that. If you're just born physically, just have this physical life, well, you're not only going to die physically, but you're going to die spiritually. And that is because of the penalty of sin. And that is what sends a person to hell. I'm guilty, isn't that right? I've sinned. <laughs> there isn't a person on the face of the earth that hasn't. For all of sin. We've all sinned. We're all in the same boat. There isn't any of us better than someone else. Absolutely not. We're all in the same kettle of fish, so to speak. That's right. But, you see, since I sinned, well, here I am alive. God tells me I'm going to die physically. Every funeral verifies it. Isn't that right? Every cemetery verifies death is a reality. If I've just been born physically, then I'm going to die physically, and I'm also going to spend an eternity apart from God. But, but, God loved me, and he sent his son. He wants to forgive my penalty. He wants to take care of that. And so he sent his son, the Lord Jesus. He died for sin once. Now then, if something takes place for me, then I can be freed from that penalty. Christ has died. He died for the penalty of everyone. Eh? Absolutely so. And he also died that I might not serve sin anymore. I'm going to be plagued with it. But I don't have to serve it anymore. Because I can become a child of God. That's what means being born again. By trusting that Christ died for me. And you know, when I have trusted the Lord Jesus, I am 
free from that penalty and I become a child in the family of God whereby I no longer have to be in Satan's family serving sin. I'm plagued with sin, but I don't have to be under that dominion. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the sixth chapter of the book of Romans where we learn about that in a verse or two, Romans chapter 6. Now I want to begin reading with verse 8. Verse 8, Romans chapter 6, verse 8, down through verse 14. Now you watch your Bibles as I read and just listen. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Isn't that great? For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be, in, uh, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through some preacher, not through the ministry of Northland or anything like that. But I can be alive through Jesus Christ. No other way. That's not wonderful. All right. Let not sin therefore reign. Be boss, you see, in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust of it. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. Isn't that wonderful? I'm free. And you remember the illustration that we gave you the last time? <clears throat> Suppose... I had committed a grievous crime in society and I was on death row to be executed. The payment for my sin is death. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And then just before the execution date, here a pardon. Pardoned by the ones in authority comes to me. And so, by virtue of that pardon, it isn't that I wasn't guilty. Guilty, yes, indeed, I've proven guilty. But here's a pardon that comes. And if I receive that pardon, then I'm no more under the dominion of the power of the penalty of that sin. I have the authority of a pardon that is written. I have the authority of a pardon that is written. I am forgiven of my sin. Not that I didn't commit it, but I'm pardoned of it. I have the authority of God. That is forgiveness. You see, he removed the cause of for the offense and he set me free that twofold emphatic uh, truth is true for forgiveness removal of the cause and then setting me free with a pardon isn't that lovely that's forgiveness so before God, on the one condition that I will trust or believe in Jesus Christ, on that one condition, I am forgiven. I'm forgiven. Never, 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 never have that brought up before me again. Amen. That's wonderful. Now, it's one thing to know that. 
But it's quite another thing to have it yourself. My sister called me this morning. She has a very, very sweet daughter-in-law. She happens to uh, be uh, a dear young girl that uh, is a member of another type of religious persuasion. And for the first time in many years, my sister had the opportunity to talk with her. She's been closed up to this time. And I sat up for about three or four hours talking in a very compatible manner. And my sister said, you know, she believes, but she hasn't received it. You see, you can know that. It's one thing to know. It's quite another thing to trust. It. I can know it. Just as if there I was in death row. Here's a pardon that's brought to me. It's yours, Al Clark. Sure, I believe that. That's my name. I believe that's mine. But I don't think I want it. <laughs> All right. If I don't want it, <clears throat> I might want to think another time when they slip that necktie around my neck. Eh? And that rope begins to tighten a little, and I stand over that door, which isn't the, lo the Lord, which says, I'm the, way, the door. <laughs> it's a door of death. Trap door. Forgiven before God. Are you? the question. Because forgiveness involves a removal from the cause where the consequenting pardon to be set free from the dominion. Not from the presence of sin. That's going to plague you. But no longer serving this as master now that is what I am before God if I trust the Lord Jesus. Forgiveness is wonderful. But now then, having become a child of God, I've also got a problem because of the presence of sin, haven't I? Now I've got a problem with the presence of sin being a child of God in this old world because I'm not in heaven, not before God, but with God and with man. You got any trouble that way? If you haven't come around, I'll let you have some of mine. Because you're going to find as you endeavor to walk as a child of God, you don't walk perfect either. You still got your problems. Now that bothered me. What about forgiveness now? All right. That is forgiveness before God. Now then, what about forgiveness with God in my pilgrim walk as a child in the family of God? What does that entail? What's involved there? Hmm? Well, it's not the matter of a penalty that's going to send me to hell. But the Bible is very clear that I need to have forgiveness with God when I sin as a child of God. The penalty, as far as before God, is taken care of. But as I walk with God and I sin, I've got a problem. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Now this is such a familiar passage, isn't it? 1 John chapter 1 beginning with verse 8. If we say, 
Now this talking about Christians. Talking about those who are forgiven before God. Now then, my walk with God as a child. If we say that we have no sin, okay, here's, here's the problem now. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See that? Now, what does that mean? All right, I'm going to remove this down just a little bit. Now, suppose I sin, sin there. As I am a child of God, child in his family, because I have trusted in the Lord Jesus as my Savior, I've repented in the sense that I've had a change of mind and such as this. Now then, here I am as a child of the Lord, and uh, I sin. I have some kind of difficulty with my spiritual life in some way. Now I'm guilty. I've done it. What has it resulted in? Well, it's resulted in a break of fellowship. Break of fellowship. I'm still a child of God. But the fellowship isn't too good, is it? Um, if uh, you are somewhat normal, maybe, and uh, you're married and have children and such a matter as this, um, maybe she just doesn't see the right way all the time. Huh? <laughs> you ever have that problem? Oh, what's wrong with her? She just doesn't see it right. It isn't that you don't see it right. Never is it. <laughs> but uh, uh, there is a, there's a problem there. And so uh, there may be a little bit of a spat. There may be a little bit of a disagreement. And then uh, the communication isn't too good, is it, for a while? Hmm? Well, what's happened when you've broken fellowship? One of the children does something, and uh, there's broken fellowship. And tell them there's that making up or repenting, so we call it. Change of mind. I've done something wrong. It's the same way as a child with God. I sin. He doesn't kick me out of his family any more than you as your parents kick your children out of your family. You're, you still belong to him. No way can you become unborn in your family. Same way in God's family. But in order to have a proper relationship, I must be forgiven. I must be forgiven. There must be restoration to fellowship. The key now is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess <laughs> our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now observe something very different between this forgiveness <clears throat> and this forgiveness. Here in this matter of forgiveness, God does the removing and the pardoning you and I can do nothing. Understand? You and I can do nothing except receive or believe. But when it comes to the matter of you and I as a child in the family of God, there is a problem that you and I have to settle. You and I have to do it. And that is, we confess. 
the transgression, right? We must. And it isn't, I'm just sorry, God, that I sinned. Confession is homologeo. Homologeo. Which means to admit the transgression. To admit you've done it. Confessing it. Now that deals with activity that you're aware of. I had a young lady that just had a terrible time once in the student pastor that I had. I noticed she wasn't her same vivacious self one Lord's Day morning, and she went by and I said, something wrong, Brian, isn't it? What's wrong? Oh, I can't tell you. I said, well, i got to find out about this because it's not like her. And so I inquired, and her mother, very sincere, very dear lady, and a fine Christian. But she was sincerely wrong. She told Brian, he said, now if you do not confess all of your sins, you're going to have to answer for them. Well, that's wrong, first place. But she was worried that she had forgotten <laughs> some of the bad things that she'd done. Huh? And she just wearing herself sick. But suppose I've forgotten what I did when I was back there 10 years of age. Now listen. It isn't what you've forgotten. It's what you know is breaking the fellowship. Right? Because verse 7 here says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, continues to cleanse us from all sin. That takes care of the things that you're not even aware of. There's lots of things in this old world that defile us, but we're not aware of the fact that it breaks fellowship, anything like that, or sin before God. There's the things that you are aware of that's breaking your fellowship with the Lord. That's where you come in and where I come in. Confess that to Him. Then it says something. He forgives and cleanses. And forgiveness in that, in that sense is you're pardoned from your act with cleansing from that defilement. But you, by virtue of your confession, you remove the cause of offense. Because you and I have been the one that's broken the fellowship of God. That exact principle follows with our relationship one to another as individuals. God took care of all of the aspects of forgiveness here. You and I must come to the place of confession here. Not to some man, but to God. Now then, in our relationship one with another as, let's say, kids in the family. What is involved as far as forgiveness there? Well, one of the best passages that I know of is Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. <coughs> now, irrespective of a lot of circumstances which may come to the fore and other things which you may know about, here is the uh, inviolable principle that must take place. In the 17th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Then said he, the Lord Jesus, unto the disciples, It is impossible, that a, it is impossible but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. 
I, I kind of smile when I come to verse 5. Because, you see, he's talking about forgiveness in the family, isn't he? He's talking about difficulty. <laughs> the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> we, need to have, uh, we need to have greater faith to be able to fulfill these requirements that you're talking about when it comes to the household, household of faith. Nevertheless, what is the principle? Here is a transgression against a brother or someone, a believer, fellow believer. Now then, here we want to have forgiveness so that there might be restoration of fellowship with the transgressing believer. What is it? What must be what must be the condition for forgiveness? That is simply repentance. Repent. Now then, I think I ought to explain once again what repentance is. Repentant isn't just this, I'm sorry. Repentance in metanoc echo, which is a change of mind regarding the transgression, which simply means that in order for one to repent, most of us are so firmly convinced that we are right, isn't that right? That we continue to walk in that frame. But if that is proven that it's not right, then we must have a change of mind, isn't that right? There must be that change of mind. Oh no, I, I am wrong there. That is repentance. And that must be expressed before there can be the pardon. In other words, as we've given the illustration time and time again, suppose uh, Pat's my neighbor and, and uh, we have two pieces of property and uh, uh, my dog has given his garden fits so it's time to put up a fence and I put that fence up and uh, of course I put that fence up when he's away at work now when he comes home how you like the fence that's a good fence but I notice he's not too happy about that fence in fact what do you why aren't you happy about this fence? He says, well, I, it's a good fence and all that, but I'm not very happy where it's put. You see, here's, here, here's my house, his, his house, and uh, right, the line goes right down the middle. Well, where I put that fence, there's his house, and <laughs> I put it right up next to his, next to his house. Hmm? What's wrong? What's wrong? Well, the thing which is wrong is, I'm wrong. I put the fence over on his property, and I just snitched a few more feet. Isn't that right? And oh, Pat, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, I'm so sorry. Forgive me, Pat. I, I, I'm just desperately sorry. Well, yeah, Dr. Clark, I forgive you. Yeah, I forgive you. But remove the fence! Isn't that right? Put it where it's bones. Well, now, wait a minute, Pat. I, I, I said, I'm sorry. I want you to forgive me. As long as that fence is where it is, there's still going to be a bone of contention, right? The cause of a fence has got to be removed. Repentance has got to be a reality. Confession, in, in effect, before God, is repentance. That's admitting to God, isn't that right? That's your sin. In order for restored fellowship with God, you must repent. So must I. In order for there to be harmony in the household of faith, exactly the same wonderful <laughs> principle that gave us a right standing before God a walk with God and a walk with men got to be the same. That's what forgiveness is all about. 
And until there is forgiveness, there isn't going to be fellowship in the world. The fence has got to be removed before there can be the walk of fellowship. That's forgiveness. So, isn't it wonderful? It has a lot of ramifications. Very definitely so. I can be forgiven before God because He did all the work, didn't He? He made the provision. I couldn't die for my sin, but He sure did. And He's given me perfect pardon. That's right. All I do is accept what He's done for me by trusting Christ. Then in order to walk with Him as a child of God, I must confess my transgressions to Him. Then there's the complete pardon. There's the complete, complete cleansing. Walking with the household of faith. There must be repentance whereby there can be restored to us. Right? That is forgiveness. It's such a wonderful and glorious truth. It has some very, very significant and glorious truths for us. And I tell you folks, forgiveness, you can never violate, you can never violate the scriptural teaching of forgiveness. You can't. There's lots of things involved in it, but I trust That'll be of help. Our dear Father, we're thankful that we have that wonderful and glorious position before you because of what you've done for us, giving us perfect forgiveness in the Lord Jesus. And then the walk with yourself and the walk with one another. We're grateful, Father, for these divine principles that you lay down in the Scriptures, which are uh, immutable. We do pray that you will ever enable us to walk in the way of the scriptural teaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you.